Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to Mayor and Chief at your service. Uh, this is our, what, third or fourth, I think. Third or fourth one. Yeah. We've a whole cycle now. Right. So when I became mayor, there used to be a mayor at your service. And um, the chief and I just had loved doing things together. And we thought, let's combine it and make it a mayor and chief at your service. So we rotate. One time it's more town-centered, another time it's more focused on police activities, but we always are available to answer questions at the end of the program. Um, and, but we have a very special guest here tonight, and um, it is Jim Lewis. He is a local historian. I know. <laughs> okay, he's an opera. <laughs> <laughs> he's also was named Lord Fairfax which is a big, big deal, I know that. So um, we're very, very honored that he came here tonight. He's Thank done you. some other talks in town um, that I know of. And so thank you for being here. Um, but we're going to start off. I'm going to introduce, uh, I know you all know Chief Morris, and so he's going to have some news for us. Sure, I'm going to introduce Sergeant Kristen Ruddy, who's going to um, provide a very brief a briefing overview of a case that I know got a lot of attention in the end over the summer. Back in around June, she'll have the exact dates, a postman was robbed on Church Street. His key was taken, um, he was threatened with a gun, ended up being maced. Um, a lot of people think those cases go away and they may seem like it, but we had a break in that case a few months ago, um, and Kristen's going to give an overview, just an overview of how that case goes. She can't get all too in-depth on it because it's still going to court, it's just starting down the road of court, but I thought it'd be a good, somewhat closer for everyone that read it in highlights or you know, saw it in the paper that this is good I understanding how those cases close out. Kristen? Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to shine some light on the great work that our detectives did and our officers did on this case. If you're not familiar with it, uh, we did release a media release that happened on June 2nd, right before noon. A postal worker was collecting mail in the east end of town when a subject approached him and demanded the mail key at knife point. He just laid a knife in order to demand that key. So that does fit the definition of robbery. Police officers responded, we saturated the area. Um, we did learn that after the key was handed over with no um, resistance, the perpetrator did then pepper spray the mailman even after he had gotten what he wanted. So a rather violent crime in our community doesn't go unnoticed, right? So we did follow as many leads as we could, but we were reaching sort of a, a dead end. And I'm being told my mic is not on, <laughs> apologies. Um, but if you'll indulge me for a few moments, I know this isn't why you were here, I apologize for the interruption, but uh, great casework deserves to have some light shined on it. And our detectives followed a lot of technological leads line by line of data sets that you know are exhausting to go through um, many alert citizens brought information forward and we followed every single lead that came in it took several months about five months of just following lead after lead but we did finally turn over a rock that um, shined a light on a suspect we kept looking kept turning over more rocks and turns out we did identify the person that committed the offense we, in January, um, we conducted a search warrant on the suspect, uh, a residence in Oakton, Virginia, and we did identify two suspects. They have both since been charged. That search warrant yielded a lot of evidence. It did confirm that we were uh, correct in identifying our suspect. Uh, it's still in the court process, so I can't release too much information, but I wanted to share what we could and kind of shine some light on why these crimes are occurring. So a mail key, why would somebody go through so much violence and expose themselves to potential retaliation in order to get a mail key? Well, we're familiar, and you may be familiar, with many crime rings that are very organized that do this exact thing. So they target the mail keys, and then they locate mail um, from mailboxes that are open by that key, and they steal the checks, gift cards, money, anything of value from this mail, and they use it to uh, give themselves financial gain. So on the search warrant, this is one of the things that we found. We were 
estimating over 100 checks were located during the search warrant. Over 80 victims of fraud were identified. We are working on, you know, closing out those cases. It does take some time to identify people, make contact, um, establish jurisdiction, that sort of thing. But this is what they do. They get the routing numbers and they use those routing numbers to um, blindly try to get money for themselves. One of the physical terms is washing checks. If you've heard that, there's an online version of washing checks that is what these guys were doing. So they weren't physically changing checks, but they were using routing numbers and account numbers in order to hopefully just get money transferred through over and over again. Uh, and it, it's happening across the nation. This isn't unique to our area. This is a very organized thought process by many people. But because we did locate the perpetrators and we have arrested them, we also wanted to take the opportunity to educate and remind the public on some things we can do to keep ourselves safe. So this is a photo of the suspect. I've blacked out his eyes. But this is how he was dressed. So if you see a person in June wearing a sweatshirt, <laughs> yeah. tied up like that, by himself with a mask, you can ask yourself why and call the police. We can then make contact and find out if there's a reasonable explanation for this kind of dress in the middle of June. Um, so he was taking pictures of himself. He was scoping out the area. This is a photo he took of the neighborhood that the robbery did occur in. So again, we, we talked about how we've confirmed that we did find the actual suspects and corroborated a lot of what we believed happened. Um, and these two photos are just a small example of how uh, organized and predetermined these cases are. So we want to remind you that community safety is definitely our top priority. We're highly confident that this was uh, a targeted robbery of the mailman with specific intent to get that key. But it is an opportunity to remember these crimes, violent crimes can happen anytime, anywhere. So remaining vigilant in your surroundings, uh, alert to your surroundings and presenting yourself as a hard target is always beneficial. So walking with your head up, your shoulders back, purposefully, confidently, will deter criminals from targeting you in the first place. Time and time again, interview after interview with perpetrators, they say all the time they, they choose their victims by who they can win against. That's really one of the top priorities. So if, if they can get the jump on you, you have increased your, pers your uh, chances of getting targeted. So if they can't get the jump on you because you're alert and looking around, then you've just decreased your chances. As far as the frauds go, um, we will always want to protect our personally identifying information. PII is a common term that you may hear in the media lately. It's the latest and greatest uh, terminology for that. Um, if you're going to send checks, money orders, gift cards through the mail, drop them inside of the post office and not in one of those blue boxes or even your own mailbox. And then of course, consider using online banking. I know that has its own set of concerns. However, it's a lot more protected than checks and cash are these days. The transition has just happened to be that the safest option to avoid fraud is to do online banking. And that is just how it is. So we'll just ask you guys, if you see something to say something, call us up. You can't measure prevention. We may never get confirmation that we are right in our suspicions because if we're present and we've deterred a crime, there's nothing to measure, right? So we never get corroboration, but it never hurts to let us come in, let us do our job and figure out what's going on, okay? Thanks, Preston. Appreciate it. We'll turn the uh, program over to Mr. Lewis. Can you get some of this? Bring him up. Is it this one? Uh, yeah. There you go. Okay. And I'll be around at the end. Kristen and Captain Silmore have crime to solve, but I'll be around at the end to answer <laughs> questions if anyone has any more. Well, this is great crowd tonight. Thank you all very, very much for your interest. And uh, I hope I can come through for you with this story. Um, as many of you all know, I, I have conducted local tours 
for about 15 years now, primarily Hunter Mill Road and the areas extending from it. And when I got into researching Hunter Mill Road, and there was a reason for it, I retired 15 years ago, and uh, there were some holes in my backyard, and I was always wondering what's the deal because they don't look like they were natural, and it turned out they weren't. They were Confederate earthworks. And it wasn't just my yard, there were three other yards next to me. It was a ridge, and there was a reason. We know who the Confederate force was and why we were there, why they were there, and it had everything to do with this railroad that goes through Vienna, WNOD today. Back then, it was called the AL and H Railroad. Alexander at Loudoun in Hampshire went out to Hampshire County, Western Virginia. There was no West Virginia until 10 days before Gettysburg, and uh, it was intended to go out there and get coal and bring it back into Alexandria, because Alexandria was competing against Georgetown and D, uh, Baltimore and the other seaports in the area. So anyway, we got involved in the research in uh, Fairfax County Archaeology. We got them out for two winters, gridding, researching, mapping. We did a lot of the research. We ended up getting what is called an FX number, which has been logged in Richmond so that nobody can mess with the property before going through a process, if you will, because it is historically uh, significant. There's a great story associated with it, which I mentioned. But that's how I got involved in this stuff. So as I was researching Hunter Mill Road and what was going on with these holes, <laughs> I, uh, it led me to Vienna and the other surrounding areas, because you can, to connect the dots, you have to look elsewhere. It all relates. And so as I looked at Vienna, I started researching, you know, what was going on in the Civil War, and I found out about this cavalry brigade that was up on Air Hill. And uh, that blew me away, didn't know about that. And then I said, okay, a little bit deeper, I started researching this fellow right here, because he was commander, the primary commander of that brigade in 1863 and 64. His name is Charles Russell Lowell Jr. And I became infatuated the more I researched it. And by the way, if anyone ever wants to read a little bit more about him, this is probably the best source you'll find. So I brought this, if anybody wants to take a look at it before they go tonight. It's called The Nature of Sacrifice, and that's pretty much what he did. Now, when you combine that with the love affair with his wife, who you will find out was one outstanding lady and is renowned still today, it made for a good story. And I said, hmm. It's time to take this thing on the road. So this is my first presentation that I ever put together. I've made, uh, I've got about 25 of them. I've kind of veered into other things, but this was the first presentation I ever put together. So that's what you're gonna hear tonight. Hopefully you'll like it, okay? I presented it many times. The feedback has always been pretty positive. So not much has been thrown at me. Uh, as I've gone through all this. So anyway, without further ado, and first of all, I'd like to thank the mayor for inviting me to speak here tonight. Um, I'm used to the town hall. This is incredible. <laughs> In the future, I'll be here. <laughs> it's absolutely gorgeous. But thank you, mayor, for inviting me and everything. So here we go. Several years ago, I mentioned about me getting involved in uh, you know, the research in Vienna and everything. Uh, it led me to Air Hill and the Cavalry Brigade. Let me ask you something. Does Lowell, does that ring a bell as far as a town or a city anywhere? Where? Lowell, Massachusetts. Lowell, Massachusetts is named after his family. Now, he's the junior, and he is still revered, this fellow, 
in New England historical circles, and his wife, who you will hear about later, is revered in the New York City circles. And she was spectacular. The combination was incredible. So, let's move forward. Okay, Charles Jr., there he is. If you don't mind, I'll point up here. And his nickname was Charlie. He was the eldest son and born into a privileged Boston, Massachusetts family of Charles Lowell Sr. and Anna Jackson, his mother. Charlie, and here he is, eight years of age, uh, with his father. And of course, it's Anna on the other end, his mother. For nine generations, the family had been principal players in both the business and social circles of the city. I'm talking Boston. Sadly, Senior lost a sizable amount of the family fortune due to the panic of 1837, which touched off a major recession lasting into the mid-1840s. Realizing he wasn't a businessman, Senior now spent his days preparing a card catalog at the Boston Library. Any reversal of fortune, fortune for the family would now be left up to Charlie. Now, who really wore the pants in this family? Anna. She was the one. And she molded Charles. Everything that you're going to hear, she was the primary molder of him. So, 1850, after two years of prep school, Charlie entered Harvard at the ripe old age of 15. He was ranked first in scholarship and stayed there. He was especially fond of philosophy, science, and literature. He graduated four years later, valedictorian, again, at the age of 19. His valedictory address was, quote, the reverence due from old age to youth. <laughs> <laughs> and he argued the value of the young men came from their ideas, not their physical labor. His plan now was to spend 10 years in business, making enough money to rebuild the family fortune, or finances, and then devote himself to public service. Obviously, he could have had any pick of any job that he wanted but he took a menial job as a laborer at a nearby, nearby iron mill to understand the working man's situation. Appalled by the terrible working conditions and squalor in which they lived, he began making plans for change when he would inevitably hold a position of authority. Seeing enough, he accepted a promising management job with an iron company in New Jersey. However, he was soon found coughing up blood, stricken with TB, you got it, also called consumption. Doctors recommended he move to a warmer client, climate without work for two years. Instead, he opted for a career change into what was supposedly a healthier environment taking a job at J.M. Forbes and Company, which was a prominent investment firm back then. However, his health continued to deteriorate. He had finally accepted the doctor's orders and convalesced in Europe and North Africa for two years. Wherever he stopped, he learned the language and developed into an accomplished equestrian and proficient swordsman skills that would later serve him very well. His illness goes into remission, and he returns to the United States when he accepts an assistant treasurer slash land agent position with the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad Company. That's in southeast Iowa. In his travels, he fell in love with and bought 200 acres near Dixon, Illinois. Now remember that, because this presentation at the end is gonna come back to that land, okay? 
So, realizing his passion for the iron industry, meaning railroads, which were the big deal, AI back then, I guess, he applied and became iron master at Mount Savage Ironworks, which was in Cumberland, Maryland. November 1860, Lincoln's elected. Lowell supported him. But Lincoln was a catalyst for secession. Even with the bombardment of Fort Sumter five minutes later, five months later, April 1861, Lowell, a passive abolitionist, continued with his efforts to rebuild the family finances. One week later, everything changes. He was in Baltimore by coincidence and witnessed an angry mob attack his home state, six Massachusetts volunteers, while changing planes en route to Washington, D.C. And this is a depiction of, of that riot. Uh, this is a, April 1861. Uh, four were killed, 36 were wounded. He immediately went to Washington to apply for a commission of second lieutenant of artillery in the regular army. He applied directly to Senator Charles Sumner, stating of his qualifications. Now you're gonna get this little, you know, this little orneriness, if you will, from New England is, is built into him. And you'll hear this throughout some of his quotes. He stated of his qualifications as being able to speak and write English, French, Italian, German, and Spanish, and know enough of mathematics to put me at the head of my class at Harvard. I'm 26 years of age, and I believe I possess more or less of moral courage about taking responsibility, which seems to be at present to be found only in Southern officers. Whoa, there's that orderliness. His application was passed on to Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, who was struck by his youthful appearance and asked, what do you know of a horse? Lowell's response, enough to take a hard day's work out of him and bring him in fresh as night as any other man. Cameron was so impressed, particularly with Lowell's academic credentials. Uh, that he, again, he spoke five languages and the equestrian skills that he had acquired overseas, that he walked in trying to become a second Louis. He walks out as a captain. He's commissioned, he already get bumped. So here he is, and that is him as a captain in the third, later the sixth regiment of US Cavalry. So proficient in training, he was rewarded with command of a squadron, that's two companies. Okay, April 1862, the 6th is transported down to Fort Monroe, Virginia for McClellan's Peninsula Campaign. There, Lowell distinguishes himself, leading saber charges, so forth and so on, Williamsburg and Slatersville, and for his performance, he's nominated to brevet to major within earshot of the raging seven days battle where the sixth is encamped at Harrison's Landing. While there, Lowell takes a deep personal loss as his younger brother, right here, James, was wounded at Glendale, later dying on July 4th. And he was the first lieutenant, excuse me, First Lieutenant in the 20, 20th Mass Voluntary Infantry. McClellan, you all heard that name, George, notices Lowell's nomination for promotion and brings him in onto his staff. The work wasn't very glorious and kept him away from the fighting, particularly at Second Bull Run. Things would change in September, in particular, September 17th. All heard of this, Antietam. Folks, this is the worst day in our nation's existence. From 6 to 9.30, there were 12,000 casualties in the morning. 
and that was a cornfield and the east woods. That's one casualty every second. The entire battle was 12 hours for the day, and the average was one casualty every two seconds. After was said and done, everything, 23,000 casualties would occur over 12 hour period. As Lowell was delivering orders for General Sedgwick's division in the West Woods, he found a line routed and in retreat. He immediately called for them to rally and stem the flow to the rear. For some reason, they chose to follow. <laughs> a nearby officer recall, recalled of Lowell, quote, it seemed to me that no mounted man could have lived through the storm of bullets that swept the Ruit woods just after I saw him enter it. His horse was struck seven times and another bullet ripped through his overcoat and a final ball stuck and shattered his scabbard. Miraculously, Charles himself was untouched. Never a braggart. Now he was you know, ornery, but he wasn't a braggart. He writes the letter home to his mom, simply saying, quote, I have had my usual good luck, <laughs> but she'll have to buy a new saber and she'll have one horse the less to ride for a month or two. Learning about Lowell's actions that day, McClellan rewards Lowell by giving him the coveted honor of presenting the 39 flags, Confederate flags that they captured at Antietam and he presented them to the Secretary of War in Washington, D.C. Soon after the battle, Lincoln fires McClellan. <laughs> Yet again, remember, he went down twice. And McClellan's staff returned to their regiments and or looked for new assignments. Well, meanwhile, here we go. Governor Andrew of Massachusetts was looking to raise a second regiment of state calf. Lowell came highly recommended to recruit, organize, and train the second mass, CAV. Now, Governor An Andrew was impressed and agreed without reservation. But recruiting was tough in Massachusetts. Lowell even had to shoot a mutinous ringleader after he had taken the oath of enlistment. Here's a poster right down here, excuse me, right here, and there's Lowell. Now you'll see he's notated as a colonel right here. Lowell, um, his recruits included the hand-picked elite from the West, California. So here we go, second mass, not a one of them's from mass. They're all from California. And they were good, they were top notch. They, they originally shipped 100 around. They were so good, everybody was so impressed, they shipped another 400 around. They became known as the California Battalion. So, they were all led by this fellow right here, J. Sewell Reed. He's the one that negotiated everything. And they were sent to Camp Miggs right here, which is nine miles by rail from Boston. Lowell also became involved in the recruitment of this unit. How many people are familiar with this unit? 54th Mass? If you're not, you'll, I guarantee it'll connect shortly. It was the, a prominent uh, Lowell at that point would become involved in that recruitment with his close friend Colonel Robert Gould Shaw. Hopefully that rings a bell. If not, I'll bring it all together in a minute. He was the commander of the 54th, right here. Good looking guy. And the Shaws were a big deal family too in Boston. Very prominent. So, the 54th was the first regiment of Negroes raised in the North. Ironically, the 54th basic training was also held at Camp Meigs. In the winter of 1862-63, the two regiments, one black, one white, trained together. Here we go. As fate would have it, Charlie and Rob attended a social where Charlie became infatuated 
with his sister. <laughs> uh, ten years younger. Her name was Josephine, and you will hear me probably mention this as I go throughout. So when you hear her nickname, Effie, that's her nickname, Shaw. So, there she is. This is 1869 photo. Effie was small, delicate, and beautiful. More importantly, she was the intellectual equal of Lowell. Educated in Paris and Rome, like Charlie, she had a deep love for literature and history. Effie, more importantly, reminded Charlie of his mother. Hello, done deal. Within two months, it was Charlie who had been recruited. <laughs> and the two were engaged with a wedding date, quote, subject to military necessity. In other words, when could they get a break <laughs> from what's going on? She even moved to Camp Miggs with Lowell's mother in order to be near her hero and future husband. By April, Lowell was formally appointed colonel and commander of the second mass. Early May, Chancellorville, Union debacle, 17,000 lost and fresh troops were needed on the Union side. Charlie and the rest of Second Mass were ordered to Camp Brightwood in Washington, D.C. in support of the defenses of the Capitol. Close to the seat of war, Lowell continued to relentlessly prepare his men, and his men noted that he was always there, going through the same exercises and drills, never tiring or sparing himself, always saving administrative details until the men were resting. It was on this duty that Charlie and Effie began to correspond on a daily basis, learning more about each other, and their love grew ever stronger. There are a lot of letters that are available to read between them. So there's a lot of documentation behind this. June 10th. Lowell receives orders to track down some guerrillas who had attacked and burned the 6th Mass Michigan uh, Cavalry's camp before disappearing, disappearing into the Maryland countryside. The locals just said they disappeared, and it became obvious the guerrillas were hiding in the houses and farms they had passed. Okay, anybody have a guess who the guerrillas were? Bam! <laughs> Who else? Mosby. Yep, Mosby had just initiated a year of contact, excuse me, Lowell had just initiated a year of uh, contact between he and Mosby, which would see victories and defeats, but Mosby's never his outright destruction. Mosby was a master of hit and run operations and was nearly impossible to counter with conventional means. The only effective way of dealing with him was by way of the concept of total war, which had yet to come to Northern Virginia. Lee's retreat from Gettysburg provided Charlie with his first taste of combat as a commanding officer, as he successfully engaged a dismounted Confederate cavalry group at Ashby's Gap, which is Route 50. Just three weeks after Gettysburg, and you know, the nation is starting to feel a tad bit better because word gets out, the Union was successful, Lee is retreating, and all of that. So there's some hope. However, it's war. Tragedy would strike again. This time, it was Effie who was greatly affected. Remember that 54th, Massachusetts? Well, July 28th, this is what happens. Fort Wagner, they lost 272 of the 600 men that charged that fort, one of which was Charlie's, one of his closest friends, Commander Robert Gould Shaw, which was also Effie's brother. 
and she took it hard. Several letters between Charlie and Effie detail Charlie's attempt to console Effie. And here's a close-up. Those folks that are familiar with Boston, you're familiar with the Boston Commons? Right there. That's on the Boston Commons, and that was put up in um, 1897. And that is Robert Gould Shaw leading the 54th Mass. It's beautiful. Boston Commons. So, this event, this battle, fight, was portrayed. Now, does that connect the dots for everybody? The movie Glory, one of the best Civil War movies you'll ever see, and it's been rated as such. Now, there's Robert Gould Shaw. Anybody know who he is? Matthew Broderick. Who? Matthew Broderick. It's Ferris Bueller. <laughs> you got it. Okay, this movie made him. Everybody knows who this fellow is. Denzel Washington, best supporting actor. And this fellow right here? Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. I'll just describe him as God. I think you all know what I'm talking about. With his voice and presence, he's always the reasonable one, and uh, whatever. So, just three days later, after this, another clash with Mosby takes place, and it became obvious that a concerted effort was needed to shut down the irregular operations, which is what Mosby was. Washington responded by giving Lowell command of an independent cavalry brigade. And what they did, they put together his second mass, remember these are all California boys, with the 13th and 16th New York Cav. Now, minor issues here. Welcome, Lowell welcomes the New Yorkers, but his second mass cav, they figure it out real quick because these New Yorkers are predominantly German, and the way they looked at them was, quote, so much excess baggage to be taken care of. It was so bad that what Lowell did was he divided up his battalion, the 500, and he put them in between the New Yorkers, if you will, calves, just to bring some discipline to what they were doing. So, here's the encampment. Air Hill. Everybody know where Air Hill is in Vienna? That was on top of it. And this is a camp showing the denuded uh, landscape. And it was tasked with guarding the early warning line defensive system for Washington, D.C. And the bottom picture right here, here's Lowell. Short guy. But what do you have for, you know, uh, cavalrymen? You're not going to have these, you know, offensive linemen from the commanders on these horses. So, there's Lowell and his officers. This fellow right here, you absolutely want to remember, because I will be referring to him shortly uh, in the presentation. That is the surgeon, Oscar C. DeWolf. In August, Lowell got the upper hand on Mosby at Gooding's Tavern. Now, that's right across from Nova Community College in Annandale. There's a Fairfax County marker upright that commemorates that event. A second mass detachment put bullets in, Mosby, in Mosby's thigh and groin, almost killing them. While Mosby recovered, Lowell concentrated on other guerrillas, and there were other ones in the area, primarily Elijah White and the 35th Battalion of Virginia Cav, known as the Comanches, whatever. But here we are in the fall, and things were relatively calm. Charlie finally takes leave and heads north on October the 31st. Bam! Whoa. It's time for Effie. Here they are at their wedding. Their wedding picture, October 31st. After a few days together, both Effie and Charlie went back to camp down here 
in Vienna, both of them, on Air Hill. Here's the camp. That's the house they were in that they lived. Here's the rest of the soldiers, if you will. And here they are on top of Air Hill, Effie and Charles looking at each other on horseback. That's a pretty cool picture. So, Effie helped Surgeon Wolf, the Wolf, and Chaplain Humphrey tend to the sick and wounded in the hospital. She also endeared herself to the officers and enlisted men by conversing with them in French, Italian, and German. Remember, she was smart too. She knew a lot of languages also. So daily patrols incurred continual contact with Mosby's men and other irregulars. Lowell detested this kind of work. He called it inglorious warfare. It was primarily reactive to Mosby. His men called it police work, excuse me. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> Vienna's much better than that. <laughs> At least they got that one perpetrator great, didn't they? Anyway, however, Charlie was good at it, just like everything else he did. Periodically, he would adjust his tactics, but Mosby and his rangers would quickly adjust and things would go back to business as usual. After the war, Mosby would write in his memoirs, I have often said that of all the federal commanders opposed to me, I had the highest respect for Colonel Lowell, both as an officer and a gentleman. Okay. February 1864, appreciating Lowell's organizational skills, remember he's got all sorts of skills, the Army calls him down to Anacostia in D.C. It's really called Geesboro Point Cavalry Bureau, where they needed to overhaul their horse rehab system. And while he was there, through the end of March, they rehabbed the entire system and 20,000 horses. And here is a period photo of the horse stalls at the time. However, while he was gone, it's war. Tragedy strikes again, February 22nd, 1864. Returning east, coming back from Leesburg, a 150-man detachment of 2nd Mass and 16th New York Cab including this fella, Reed, remember, I showed you him earlier, who put the deal together to bring the boys from California. They are ambushed and routed by Mosby's Rangers. Where did this happen? Familiar with Nova Community College out in Sterling? Very close to Costco. Okay. That's where it happened, and if you drive by Route 7, which right now would drive right here, and you look this direction towards the school, you'll see this. And it's called the Ambush at Anchorage Shop, after the Anchors family who owned the property. So what happened there, though, was 12 were killed, 25 were wounded, 50 were captured, and 35 later died at Andersonville, Georgia. So, early July, Lowell is called on to assist in the defense of the nation's capital against Confederate General Jubal Early's army, which you'll see in a minute, culminating at Fort Stevens, which is in D.C. Now, this is where Lincoln would get up on what is called a parapet on top of the fort. You know, the hat's about 10 feet tall. And he's already, what, 6'4", or whatever. So he's looking around just checking things out. He's the man. Well, somebody yells out the appropriate verbiage, and it's something like this. Get down, fool! <laughs> you know who said that, supposedly? Future Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. The Massachusetts boys were manning that Fort. So, 
And he's renowned for Ball's Bluff up in Leesburg also. That was where Massachusetts boys got involved in that battle. Anyway, so Lowell got involved personally by saving the second mass, quite frankly, from annihilation in the streets of Rockville against two brigades of Early's retreating forces as he, you know, did make it <laughs> with taking Fort Stevens and retreated. Late July, Charlie is finally called on for one more important service and Effie returns home four months pregnant. Where do you think she conceived? Right after coming back from Geesboro Point in DC, rehabbing the horse rehab system, back up there, wherever Air Hill is. And that's where their daughter was conceived at that time. So, seeking an end to the war, Grant significantly altered the military objectives by appointing Philip Sherman. Uh, Phil Sherman as commander of the Army of the Shenandoah with orders to remove the Confederacy from the valley once and for all. And this is when total war kicks in. He wants to get rid of them, deprive them of their breadbasket and a favorable north-south route from which the Confederates could also turn and threaten the city of Washington. Right here is Sher Sheridan, excuse me, Sherm, yes, yeah, Sheridan. And here is finally Jubal Worley. <laughs> okay. Gruff kind of guy, but that's who he was. Now, out in the valley, this is when Lowell really shines. For weeks, Lowell's brigade is maneuvered with the Army and fought almost every day. Sheridan was so impressed with Lowell because he always responded quickly and effectively. After a reorganization in the cavalry, he was rewarded by giving command of the reserve brigade made up of the tough regular cavalry, the 1st, 2nd, 5th U.S. plus his beloved 2nd Mass. They were bad. It was considered to be the best service, best in the service. The appointment was a high honor and due to Lowell's exceptional abilities. September 19th, Sheridan's trust in putting the young volunteer in charge of the regulars paid off with big dividends versus this battle right here. And that's the third battle of Winchester. As the fighting continued into October, it, which included this. Remember Total War? Here it is. They're burning everything. Lowell continued to excel. What did they destroy? And I'm talking about the Union, because they went into Total War to eliminate the Valley once and forever as a resource for the Confederates. They burned 2,000 barns, more than 70 mills, and absconded with 7,000 farm animals, depriving the Confederates from food and all of that. Letters home, though, to Effie indicate Lowell was conflicted with the moral ambiguity of what they had been asked to do. There are people still out in the Shenandoah Valley today that remember the burning. <laughs> and of course they weren't around back then, but somebody told their grandfather and told them or whatever. So it's like Sherman in Atlanta and you know, going through the South, same thing out there. Throughout the Valley campaign, Charlie had led a charm life. He was never struck as men and horses, 13 of his own fell around him. As the days of fighting wore on, he seemed to have a premonition, as revealed in letters to Effie with comments like, quote, I should like to have Sundays quiet, and I do wish this war was over. Most telling of all, quote, 
I don't want to be shot till I've had a chance to come home. I have no idea that I shall be hit, but I want so much not to now that it sometimes frightens me. It was not to be. October 19th. How many people are familiar with the Battle of Cedar Creek? You certainly are. <laughs> okay. Cedar Creek is in Middletown, Virginia, in the valley, right above Strasburg, right below Winchester, uh, really below Kernstown, which is below Winchester. It's beautiful. I mean, the valley's gorgeous by itself, but this thing is situated, it's just so picturesque. And they have reenactments out there every year that are the biggest reenactments in the country. Um, it's just gorgeous. So, General Early's supposedly beaten army turned and launched one of the most daring and successful flanking attacks of its kind against Sheridan's ill-positioned army at Cedar Creek. And this is a picture I took, 2014 sesquicentennial, which is a 150-year-old uh, you know, celebration or commemoration, if you will. Sheridan wasn't on the battlefield, as he had spent the previous night in Winchester, having just returned from a conference in Washington, D.C. on strategy. What do we do? At 5 a.m., early strikes, and in short order, he crushes two of the Union Army Corps. Lowell and the cavalry established a position at the extreme left where the brunt of the attack occurred in order to stabilize the line and buy time until Sheridan arrives back on the battlefield. Here he comes. <laughs> That's the print of Sheridan. Where does he arrive? Very close to here. Newt, if you remember, this is the marker that's no longer there, but it's very close to here uh, as to where he arrived. And this is Route 11, the Valley Pike, basically today excluding that marker right there. So, <clears throat> by the way, here is what the Valley Pike looked like. That's the turnpike. Why do you think they have stone walls on turnpikes? I love it. Deer in headlights. It's because you got to pay to use the turnpike. So when you see that toll house or booth or whatever, and you're coming up on it, you make a right, you make a left, you skirt the toll house, right? And then you get back on the turnpike later on. Well, that kept you on the turnpike. You couldn't turn left or right. Pretty interesting. Anyway, <clears throat> Lowell's men withstood three successive charges, losing another horse. On the third charge, a bullet careens, careens off a nearby stone wall and slams squarely into Lowell's chest, but did not penetrate. A mushroom piece of lead was found nearby. Reeling in his saddle, he was helped to the ground. Dizzy, deprived of voice, sapped of strength, and with blood on his lips, he said, quote, it is my poor lung. Remember, what did he have earlier? You got it. Not a good thing to get shot with TB already. Anyway, <clears throat> he said, I have not lost a drop of blood yet. I want to lead in the final charge. Most likely, the bullet had collapsed one of his tubercular lungs and he was bleeding internally. At 4 p.m., the order came for the counterattack and Lowell said, sure, he said, I'm well now. <laughs> yeah, got it. <laughs> anyway, too weak to mount his saddle without assistance, Lowell was lifted and strapped into a saddle and rode to the front of 3,000 cheering cavalrymen. He summoned his strength, drew his sword, and whispered to an aide to sound the charge. 
That's how much energy he had. The bugles gave the signal, and they rode rapidly towards the enemy, which were the Confederate, or Early's Confederates. Now, you know you're important when you get a print. And this is a iconic print of what happened almost immediately. And just as they were in the thickest of the fire from the town, a cry arose. The colonel is hit. Famed illustrator J.E. Taylor sketched Lowell's final charge, and there's Lowell. And he got hit from a sharpshooter up here on the Brinker House. We know exactly where that is in Middletown. And he was hit right away. He fell from his horse and was carried on a litter behind his men. The counterattack was successful, and the village of Middletown was retaken. Charlie was moved to a house in the village where DeWolf tended to him. There's the house. That's what it looks like today. It's what you saw last year. That's it. Ironically, Lowell's commission as Brigadier General, which Sheridan had put in for, was finally signed this very day. Lowell never knew that commission was coming. He was 29 years old at the time. Here is DeWolf's account, the surgeon, of Charlie's final hours. There were four or five in the room. Lowell lay on the table, shot through the shoulder to shoulder. The ball had cut the spinal cord on the way. Of course, below this, he was completely paralyzed. Four others were lying desperately wounded on the floor. One officer was in great pain. Lowell spent much of his ebbing strength helping him through the straits of death. When he heard the groans of the rebel wounded that were brought in the yard, he sent me away to look at them. As the, ninth, the 19th wore on and his strength failed, I said, and this is the surgeon, Colonel, you must write your wife. He answered that he was not able to, but I said, it could be managed. So, putting a scrap of paper on a piece of board, DeWolf holds his hand and scribbles a note goodbye to Effie. And thus, he, write, he wrote a couple of words of farewell to her. Lowell spoke less and less often. The following morning, on the 20th, at 8 a.m., Charlie ceased to breathe the air of the earth, and a wolf pronounced his death. Now, so esteemed was he. Here is the report from Sheridan to Grant, and there's Lowell's name, right here. <clears throat> and this is where Sheridan uh, encamped. I don't know if you've ever been out to Middletown, but this is still there. It's called Bell Grove. It's beautiful, and that's the print of what that looked like back in 1864. Now, I told you I got infatuated with this, which you could tell, right? <laughs> Lowell's loss was felt deeply within the brigade and the Army's high command. General George Custer openly wept, saying, we all shed tears when we knew we had lost him. It is the greatest loss the Cavalry Corps ever suffered. Sheridan himself remarked, I do not think there was a quality which I could have added to Lowell. He was the perfection of a man and a soldier. Another high official said, I do not think there is any officer in all the Army so much as beloved as Lowell. October 28, Charlie's funeral was held at Harvard Chapel in Cambridge. So they took him home with the appropriate military honors. 
He was buried, and I told you I went. <laughs> this, I took these photos. This is one of the prettiest cemeteries on earth. Not just the United States, on earth. This is called Mount Auburn, and it's in Cambridge. It's spectacular, and it's a who's who of New England is buried there. Anyway, the, uh, some of the people that are there, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Julia Ward Howe, who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, you might have heard him, uh, James Russell Lowell, who was his, ambassador, uh, his uh, uncle, a uh, famous, well-known ambassador, author, playwright. If Charlie had to give the ultimate sacrifice during the war, he would have probably picked Battle of Cedar Creek, and here's why. It, along with the fall of Atlanta, enabled Lincoln's reelection. Lincoln was toast until Atlanta and this battle right here because the nation had tired of the war and they were ready to replace him. Guess who they were going to replace him with? This guy looked familiar? It's like a bad dream. <laughs> that's, that's McClellan, who he had fired twice. And McClellan was much more sympathetic to the Southern cause. I'll just leave it at that. And uh, his running mate was George Pendleton, right here. Lincoln was so convinced he was not going to win prior to Atlanta and Cedar Creek he had written a concession speech and put it in his top drawer of his desk in Washington. So, from Lowell's point of view, this so-called peace that would have been preserved via McClellan would have rendered everything they had done pointless and all that his kinsmen had died for. So revered was Lowell that his admirers placed this memorial right here. If you're familiar with Middletown, this is the Wayside Inn. Very historic. Here is the memorial right here. Very few people know that, and it's right across the street from the house where he passed away. Can you read the inscription, Jim? On the, on Excuse the, me? Uh, can you read the inscription? He read the inscription? Yeah, he, he died. died. He oh, fell yeah. in action near this place, October 19th. No, no, the inscription, the, right, the writing, the last writing. He died. Oh, he died too early for his... Country? Oh, yeah. That's I can't good point. Can't, can't make it out? Too early for his country. For what again? Too early for his country. Okay. So, I told you I went to Cambridge. I went looking for this. This is the Annaberg Hall. Um, it's called, excuse me, Memorial Hall. It was built in 1878. It's in Cambridge. The hall was built as a monument to Harvard's Union War Dead, and it houses the Annenberg Dining Hall, where a marble bust of Charlie sits to this very day in a niche at the West End. Now, what's really neat about this, and this is a period photo of it, I tried twice to get in here, and I got thrown out twice. Yeah. <laughs> so they had good security up there. <laughs> I could normally get in, but boy, they shut me down. Anyway, because Lowell Starr's Brigadier General did not reach him before his death, Chaplain Charles Humphrey, with Lowell in the second mass cab, suggested to the sculptor to put it in a spray of laurel under his bust, and there it may be seen today. Not used to this, obviously. There it is. See its circle? That's a star that he never knew he was ever going to get. 
As Charlie was un obviously unable to sign his new commission, the current Secretary of War, Stanton, authorized an exception, allowing his posthumous promotion to become official. Okay, this is where I normally stop the original presentation. But people started asking, what happened to Josephine? So, here we go. This is really cool. And I enjoyed putting this together. Barely a month after Charlie's funeral, Josephine gave birth to their only child, named for her father that she would never know. The daughter was called Carlotta. And Josephine would spend the rest of her life as a widowed mother, never remarried, and dressed in black every day. She decided to honor the deaths of her brother and husband by becoming a social reformer. In 1874, she and Carlotta, who became her secretary, moved to Manhattan, where Effie became deeply interested in the social problems of New York City. She spent the next 35 years visiting prisons and poorhouses, campaigning for parks and better schools, and fighting for civil service reform and the rights of workers. Two years later, first woman appointed to the New York State Board of Charities, big deal, New York City, 1882. She was the founder of the New York City Charity Organization Society, which gave form and direction to all efforts of distinguished philanthrop philanthropists in the city and beyond. She guided that organization for 25 years. 1890, she established the New York Consumers League, which was probably her most wide-ranging and effective organization, which dealt with women's rights and working conditions. It was adopted as chapters in many other cities across the country. And there is a boss relief of Effie in 1899. At 1905, at the age of 61, Josephine Shaw Lowell died of cancer at her home in New York City. Her memorial attracted hundreds of people and at least 50 eulogies as well as articles in numerous daily newspapers. So respected was Effie that the Josephine Shaw Lowell Fountain in Bryant Park, right here, was dedicated shortly after her death. This is a photo in 1934, and that's what it looks like today. It was the city's first public memorial dedicated to a woman. Now, people ask, what happened to the daughter? There she is. There's Carlotta. And this is 1888 photo of her. She lived with her mother and never married. Now, remember I said up front about those 200 acres in Dixon, Illinois? Okay, it's wrapping up right now. Remember those 200 acres her father bought while working for the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad just one year after her mother died, 1906, and in memory of her parents, Carlotta donated that land to the city of Dixon, and it became a nature sanctuary known as Lowell Park. And here is a signature structure called the Woodcote cottage, and it was made out of native timber and limestone quarry on the site. This park is on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's a very popular, uh, popular destination for many, particularly during the summer months. Okay, you're going to love this. <laughs> Who said yeah? Somebody knew. <laughs> Who knew this? 1926 to 1933. This park employed a little-known lifeguard at the time at the Rock River Beach. And he's shown here on the cover of what else? The Lowell Park book. 
Yep, he's 40th president. Now, what's really cool about this is that he was reported to have saved 77 people from the river during his tenure there. So, we're going to wrap it up. Carlotta died September 19, 1924, and was laid to rest with her parents. I took this photo. Here's Charlie, Josephine, and Carlotta. And that's in the family plot, if you will. Charles and Josephine had become the, quote, useful citizens, unquote, they had privately expressed in their letters to each other. He threw duty on the battlefield. She, who learned to perform as a citizen, never desiring a military life, Charlie had been drawn into the nation's conflict through an inert sense of duty. He was a born cavalier, high-spirited, quick, flashing his plans into instant orders and pushing his orders to prompt execution. Yet, with all this dashing chivalrous spirit, he was always calm and self-possessed. He led from the front, and his men readily followed. I think that's obvious with all the horses that are no longer around. His superiors admired his intellect, leadership, and bravery. There is little doubt his qualities were coveted by both sides of the conflict. One can only imagine what he might have achieved and contributions he would have made if he had survived the war. Hopefully, this presentation has enriched your appreciation for the immediate area's very historic heritage. Maybe, because I do this, but it's up to you. When you look towards or drive up Air Hill in the future, just envision Charlie and Effie on horseback chatting and remember their time and efforts here in Vienna during the American Civil War. It's been my honor and my privilege. I thank you very much for your time and consideration.